Welcome to episode 224 of Angela Watson's Truth for Teachers. I'm your host, Angela Watson, and I'm here to speak life, encouragement, and truth into the minds and hearts of educators and get you energized for the week ahead. Today, I'm going to be talking with Colorado Teacher of the Year for 2021. His name is Gerardo Munoz about how he developed the confidence to teach authentically. Visit truthforteachers.com to get the transcript or find our Truth For Teachers podcast community on Facebook. A big thanks to Advancement Courses for sponsoring today's show. You can earn graduate credits or CEUs through over 280 online PD courses in 20 different subject areas for K-12 teachers. Everything is online and self-paced, and you have six months to complete. Right now, you can save 20% off any course with the code TRUTH. That's less than $120 per graduate credit hour. To learn more, visit advancementcourses.com. In this episode, you'll hear my guest talk about work-life balance through the lens of practices he learned in the 40-hour teacher work week full year program. 40-hour has helped nearly 50,000 educators maximize their contractual time so they're not working endlessly on nights and weekends. The program is only offered once per year, and the next cohort begins this summer. Scholarship applications are accepted from May 1st to 25th, and you can be entered to win a free membership in a giveaway as well. Just go to 40htw.com, 40htw.com, to learn more about the program, as well as the scholarships, or sign up to be entered there in the giveaway and receive sample materials sent to your inbox. That's 40htw.com. At a time when teachers are experiencing increased scrutiny and mistrust and criticism from so many angles, it can be difficult to have the confidence needed to feel like you're doing good work and you can truly be yourself. The real you can get quickly buried under an ever-growing pile of expectations that have nothing to do with what you really care about or the reasons that you got into this profession in the first place. So where does confidence as a teacher come from when you're constantly hearing about everything you're doing wrong? How do you know what you should and shouldn't be focusing on? What's a good use of your time and what's not? And most importantly, how can you be sure that you're showing up as the person that your students need you to be? Answering these questions is a personal, lifelong journey. And I think the answers from my guest today will really get you thinking about how to answer those questions for yourself. I'm talking with Gerardo Munoz, a teacher of middle and high school social studies in Denver. I was introduced to Gerardo's work through a podcast that he co-hosts with Kevin Adams called Two Dope Teachers, and through his advocacy for equity and anti-racism. We followed one another on Twitter, their handle is Two Dope Teachers, that's T-O-O, Dope Teachers, for a couple of years, and Gerardo eventually joined the 40-hour teacher workweek program that I created. And he credits it for helping him stay in the profession and going on to receive recognition as Colorado's Teacher of the Year for 2021. That's obviously one of the best possible outcomes I could ever hear about my work. And there's just a lot of mutual respect and admiration between Gerardo and I. So listen in as he shares the experiences and self-reflection practices that have given him the confidence to teach authentically and bring out the best parts of his students as well. So thank you so much for being here today, Gerardo. I'm l- really looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, me too. No, I'm uh, like, I'm starstruck. Like, it, it's <laughs> amazing to share a space with Angela Watson, like the Angela Watson. So I, I, it's also an honor to be here um, on your show with you. Well, I'm really glad because uh, I think you are a great model in the area of authentic teaching and Um, I really want to dive into what that process has been like for you. One of the things that I think is so incredibly impactful about your work is that you approach teaching through a lens of who you are and what you believe. In other words, you recognize that who you are as a person matters just as much, if not more than what you actually do with students in terms of specific tools and strategies. So I would love for you to share more about this process of personal and professional growth. How has the person that you are with your students changed over the years? Uh, this, is, this is a great question. Um, you know, I think I think overall, um, it's been a process of learning to trust myself. 
Um, and that probably goes into some things in, in my childhood and, you know, some of the traumas I experienced and, you know, the, just the background that I came from, but also I, I came, I didn't go through a traditional teacher, uh, qualification or licensure program. Um, I was raised by a public school teacher and a youth soccer coach. Um, but even so teaching wasn't really on my radar, even when I finished college. Um, so I kind of came into work with, you know, what was kind of viewed as a naive mindset. So my, my whole thing was, okay, if I'm going to be an effective teacher, if I'm going to be the teacher that these students need, I've got to actually find out what they can teach me, you know? And at the time, having started teaching in the late 20th century, as I like to tell my students, um, I, um, I, I had a lot that I just had to learn, but, but also the norm wasn't to amplify student voice, let alone center it at that point. Um, the teacher is still considered to be the center of what happens in a classroom. And, and I think while the teacher absolutely matters, um, the, the role of student voice has really changed over the years. And I, I like to kind of say that I was in at the ground level for that. So, um, people looked at me with a little bit of curiosity and they're like, so wait, you're actually asking the students what they think about your teaching. And there was a lot of distrust where I was working. And so, um, but I, I asked them things. I asked them why they chose to enroll in my class. I asked them how they best learned. I asked them when they had felt most supported, uh, by or excited about going to school. Um, which was a little bit of a shift for them. It was an alternative, um, you know, it was an alternative school for students who really struggled with attendance and all of its attendant issues that came with it. So, so I think, um, I think that's one thing that hasn't really changed over almost 22 years teaching. I still really, uh, try to customize the learning experience to, for my students. Um, and then, and, and then it's a process of me learning. So, um, I, I've always had this little bit of a complex about not coming in through traditional means. And, uh, but I think it's also fueled me in terms of how I can be creative, uh, when engaging my students. Mm, that's such a good point about how student voice has changed over the years, you know, and how much that, that was not a normal thing, um, back in the beginning when I started teaching in 1999. Yeah. Um, oh, we you know. started the same year. <laughs> oh, did we? Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So, so then you have that same frame of reference as me. It was very much, um, you know, an authoritarian type of, um, of classroom management was really popular, especially since I was teaching in more urban areas. And as we know that in those kinds of schools, often, you know, it, there are, there are preconceived notions about how these kids need a heavy hand. They That's need right. strong discipline. Yep. You know, yeah. they need strict rules. We yep. can't, you know, you mentioned the word distrust of students yep. in your answer. And that, that shaped my early teaching years too, because it didn't feel right to me to emulate what I was seeing, but that's what right. all the good teachers did. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, to your point, when it becomes a power issue, when it becomes an authoritarian model, even if it's a benevolent authoritarian model, it's still an authoritarian model. That's right. You know, I had the benefit of um, being an early childhood major. So oh, yeah. my focus in college was K-3. Mm -hmm. And I think the early childhood approach, you know, learning through play and those sorts of things, a yeah. very child-centered uh, way of teaching and learning. That was my background. So even when I started teaching older kids, I still came from that. And I'm really fortunate that I had oh, no you know, a, a great experience in, um, in college. I had just wonderful, wonderful models for, uh, for how, for how to ask kids questions, you know, and to bring them into the learning experience. That's something that yeah. I think not everyone has had. And it, it's so powerful once yeah. you learn how to do that with kids. Definitely. What have you learned about yourself over this past year in particular through pandemic teaching? How has that shaped the way you think about education? Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so much. Mm -hmm. um, so first and foremost, I think I've learned a lot about myself. Um, I didn't experience any new challenges. I've always had some um, mental health struggles that I think I discovered way later in life. Like these were things that it would have been helpful to have a name for them when I was um, a really frustrated and kind of turbulent teenager. Um, but, you know, having been having been having had the privilege to name those things like depression, like anxiety, um, you know, those kinds of things, you know, kind of framed a lot of what I went through. I didn't experience any new challenges. They were just intensified. Um, and so 
you know, the, the mood swings were really, really dramatic. The highs would get really, really high and the lows would get really, really low. And, um, and it kind of impressed upon me the urgency about, you know, sort of, um, seeking my, seeking my own healing, um, process and, and model and framework. Um, as, as a teacher, you know, and I think, I think that a hundred percent of teachers, uh, will have this resonate with them. I experienced a really profound disruption of my identity. Um, because so much of what makes me who I am as a teacher is what I do in person, engaging students, having quick conversations in the hallway, in the cafeteria, when I'm on lunch duty before and after school, helping sixth graders open their lockers, like all of these things that, you know, I kind of stake my identity in, um, was really, really tough. And, and honestly, I did feel like a first year teacher again, uh, which was fine when I was 22. (laughs) Um, but (laughs) extremely frustrating at age 45 because I had a track record. I've been named a distinguished teacher under evaluation system seven years in a row and not being able to do those things that I think made me a distinguished teacher, um, was extremely upsetting and, um, and, uh, and it really disrupted, um, me, um, you know, on a systemic level, I I've, I'm, I'm, (laughs) I'm trying not to face a hard fact that most of what we do in school is simply not sustainable um, from the amount of hours that are expected of teachers, um, the amount of unpaid hours that are asked of so many teachers um, and the the types of academic and social emotional practices that simply don't meet the needs of most students and especially the needs of our most minoritized and marginalized communities. Um, the meaningless work, the extent to which we try to sanction students' physical bodies, telling them when they can move, when they can eat, speak, come, drink water, go, like it becomes even more meaningless, um, in this pandemic situation. Um, and we were, we were remote, fully remote until January. And now we're doing some hybrid teaching, but the majority of my students are still, um, remote learning. And so like, what am I going to do? Drive to your house and, you know, make sure that you're doing your work and make sure that you're in front of your camera and make, you know, so, right. so, and I think that there are some students, despite the struggles of trying to be, um, trying to be, you know, engaged and all that kind of stuff. There are students who are starting to discover, yo, I got some power in this. Like mm-hmm. I can just opt out. And yeah, there might be a phone call home and yeah, there's that kind of thing. But on a day to day basis, nobody's policing me. I can go to the bathroom when I want to. I can go and get a snack when I want to. Although it's really funny. There are students who will still ask permission to go to the restroom. And (laughs) I'm just kind of like, um, of course, because even if I said no, you could still go. I'm not going to get mad at you, you know, but, but, you know, it kind of speaks to how they've been indoctrinated (laughs) in this kind of regulatory like system. Can I go get a snack? I'm like, absolutely. I'm sitting here chomping on a bagel while I teach you. So, (laughs) you know, um, but, you know, I think the big thing is that, you know, there's um, there's a real need for equitable access to things. And these are things I've been screaming about for 20 years, uh, largely in rooms that view it as a box to check. OK, this was our equity practice. This was our SEL practice. And so now we did that. Now we can do real school. Right. Um, and so I've been talking to anyone who will listen about the importance of identity development and um, access, uh, you know, because e- even with learning. Um, being 100% virtual, like we, the, all of the same systems of inequity are still there. Their, their zip codes, for example, still determine the type of educational support they receive. Mm. Say more about the importance of identity development as a central feature of learning and growing. That's powerful. Yeah. I actually, you know, I, I once said this out loud at a staff meeting and everybody looked at me like I was speaking a, a, a world language that they didn't know. <laughs> um, because, you know, that was always, and, you know, there could be an aspect in, in my initial, in my first graduate program, um, we talked a little bit about how teacher lenses, lenses really should be interrogated. Um, because often, I mean, it's our, it's our lens. It becomes our practice. And so I didn't have a lot of opportunities to understand my identity as the son of a Mexican immigrant with a sixth grade education and, um, and a, and a white mother whose family had been in Colorado for four or five generations. Um, but I think Corky Gonzalez's insight about identity development really um, speaks to me as a civil rights leader um, from the city of Denver, where he said that um, if a, if an individual walks into room into a room with a strong sense of who they are, what's important to them, um, then that person can can survive and thrive in any room that they enter. And so, you know, having 
student center. Well, what has your experience been in school? What has your experience been taking a history class? Have you ever thought about where your name comes from? Do you know? Um, those are things that I think are so important because, you know, A, you're implicitly sending the message to students that you matter in this space and who you are matters in this space. But also, once you start the process of identity development with adolescents, they don't ever stop. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's something that they will always come back to and think about. I've got students who have former students who have PhDs now who are telling me, man, I still think about, you know, the identity hands we did in class. And I still think about the, you know, in, in hip hop studies, when you made us like talk about how great we were, you know, and that kind of thing. And so I do think it's really important because it, it, it creates a sense of membership. And when there's a sense of membership, uh, students can thrive. Can you tell us about that identity hands activity? Yeah, I actually, so I adapted this from a, um, from the facing history and ourselves, um, you know, uh, program and mm -hmm. association. It's just amazing stuff. And, um, so what they do is they take, um, they take a p big piece of construction paper. They put their hand in the middle of it and trace it. And on the inside of your hand, you, um, draw or write or collage the things that others may not super know about you, but that are really important to you. Uh, things you care about, who are your loved ones, who are your best friends, what do you do in your spare time, that kind of thing. What do you think about um, when you're not at school? And then the outside is how others may perceive you for better or for worse. And um, and they're allowed to um, they're allowed to do it in any way that works. Like some students are really comfortable just doing these kind of word collages and others will draw things. And then I also tell them, um, the, you know, that Jay-Z had a great quote in his book, Decoded, where he says that he talks about how his rap lyrics may not make sense to everybody, but it doesn't matter if they make sense to other people that he's not doing them for other people to understand. He, he says, you might listen to my song four or five times. And if you think about the words, it'll hit you differently every single time. And so that's why I tell the students, I say, I don't need this to make sense to me. I don't need this to be your handbook on how I need to understand you. This is for you, not for me. And I realize I've been working on the same identity hand for like five years and mm -hmm. they're all impressed with it. I'm like, this is just a consequence of time. Like I'm just, I've just spent a lot of time doing this. And the more time you spend, the more you realize that you're a complex and, you know, kind of dope person. <laughs> <laughs> I love that so much. I was um, I was reading an article about um, when you were awarded Colorado Teacher of the Year for mm. 2021. Thank congratulations on that, by the way. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, and one of your students in the article, they they quoted her, her name is Sophia, and and she said, uh, "Mr. Munoz is going to be the teacher that I remember when I'm like 90 years old. He inspires me daily to live authentically and be true to my beliefs." And I thought that was so powerful. I mean, first off, what better thing could you ever hear a student say yeah, about right? you? <laughs> Number one, okay, highest compliment. Um, but I wonder, is that something you intentionally set out to inspire your kids to do? And what kinds of practices do you think enable you to have that impact on kids? Yeah, no, uh, wow, uh, deep question. Uh, first, I just, Sophia is like one of my favorite young humans I've ever met. Truth speaker, uh, honest person. Yeah, it, it actually is really intentional. Um, you know, and the, the, I really think that most of what we bring into our classrooms as teachers is work that we've done on ourselves before we can work on our students. And so I have to create a mindset in myself that says every single young person in this room is exactly who they are supposed to be. So my job is not to change their personalities. My job is not to make them different humans. My job is to help them identify their strengths and um, help them gain skills and behaviors that are going to amplify who they are. And so I really, um, I, that's a really intentional thing that I have to keep in mind. So if I've got a student who is stereotyped as the class clown, I'm like, well, this is obviously a young person of unique intelligence. We know about the correlation between intelligence and sense of humor. Mm -hmm. um, this is a person who is charismatic because people laugh. This is a person who knows how to read a room for the most part, maybe not the teacher, <laughs> um, but this is a person with immense gifts. And you look at what people like Dave Chappelle have 
have accomplished or uh, Margaret Cho and some of these amazing entertainers who just really speak truth through humor. And so it isn't about, okay, Marcus, stop playing around in class. It's more about, dang, Marcus, you're really good at reaching an audience, man. I think, I think we should think about how we, how we give you more opportunities to do that. Um, and then I'm, then I really, um, so then the other practical aspects of it are, again, it's getting deep into the identity, identity work with students. It's the first thing that I do. I have a survey where I ask them to tell me as much as they want to about themselves. They're fully allowed to submit the survey with no answers on it because they don't owe me their life story. They don't owe me insights on who they are. Um, and so they, so we do that. Um, but the other thing I do is I talk to every kid in the school. We're a six through 12 school. And, um, I start building relationships with students before they're even in my class. So I'm talking to them during passing period. If I like your kicks, if I like your t-shirt, if you're singing a song that I like, um, you know, I'm going to talk to you about it and I'm going to try to get to know you because, you know, if you're going to prioritize like classroom management and positive behavior, like I love having kids come into my classroom being like, man, I've wanted to have your class for four years and here I am. And it's just a great place to start. Um, and then we, then, then I just hype their talents. I'm like every kid's hype man. Like I hype their talents, their gifts and their strength. And I honestly don't even highlight their weaknesses because they probably spend all of their time like agonizing about their weaknesses. I don't have to point them out. And honestly, I don't know how useful it is to harp on what, like, you know, that whole philosophy of like tear kids down, then build them up. I just think it's so offensive. Um, because it assumes that you don't bring anything that's good for me and I have all of the keys to your success, um, in this room. And so I just hype them up and we set goals together. Um, I teach an AP class and I invite parents into the conversation where I say, honestly, the, the key to being successful in an advanced placement history class is just knowing what you want to get out of it and working towards that. So if you want a five, there are behaviors that you'll need to engage in, in order to reach that goal. If all you want is to learn a ton and talk to cool people about cool things that happened in history, well, you know, there's a way for you to engage on that level. And so, um, so I think it's really important to do that. Um, and to just always just be positive and, you know, be that kind of, uh, positive, like presence when students walk into my learning space, which they'll tell you that I define my learning space as the entire school. <laughs> <laughs> what you're saying derives so much from your confidence in yourself and knowing yourself. Because when I think about the teachers that I know who struggle in this area, the, the yeah. teachers who see kids really for what they're lacking for the deficits rather than for the strengths. That's right. Um, I think that a lot of it comes from not having confidence in themselves. Yeah. They're not really secure in who they are. They're not really sure who they are. Yeah. Their identity maybe has shifted over the years. They've certainly watched the teaching profession change over the years and the oh, expectations man. for teachers change. Mm -hmm. And they're not really sure where they fit in. Yeah. And I think that lack of confidence and that self doubt makes it harder to see your students for who they are. Like Absolutely. for me, learning to have empathy toward other people and, and be less judgmental toward them and more accepting of them and to see their strengths and gifts has come from accepting all the parts of me yeah. and understanding myself, you know, making peace with my past, yeah. with things that I've said and done, with who I was, with yeah. who I'm not. Yeah. And then I can extend that out to other people. And it, it sounds a little cliche, but I'm thinking that's, that's so much of the root of it. Yeah. And that's what makes it, challenging because that's lifelong work. Yeah. I can't just say, you know, be every student's hype man. You like, you, I think you also have to be your own hype man that's right, that's right. <laughs> in order Absolutely. to do it for other, for other kids. <laughs> totally. Right. And I think you do that so well because, um, you know, you do have that confidence, but there's also a deep humility in it too. It's not an arrogance. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's been a process for me too, to your point. Like I am, you know, even as I occupy this platform as a, as a literal state teacher of the year, um, I have trouble accepting it. I have trouble accepting that, you know, the first thing I said when I was, when I was, uh, surprised with the award was like, I'm not even the best teacher in this school, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, like, it, like the DCIS teacher of the year is somebody else. It's not me. And, you know, it's been a real process, especially over the, you know, since I passed the age of 40, I think it's, it's helped a little bit, um, as I've kind of, stayed learning and stayed reflective. Um, but I, man, I had no confidence as a kid, except for when it came to like hip hop music. And, you know, when I was, and again, you know, I think that the best teachers are the ones that are also in the pro engaged in the process of learning with their students. When I taught the hip hop studies course that I created, um, one of the things that jumped out was that 
rappers, regardless of what you think about hip hop as, you know, as an audience, rappers express confidence. <laughs> you know, they harness the power of words. When they step into a, into a space, they leave no doubt that that is their space. And that was something I always aspired to as a kid. I was like, man, how can I be so good with words and so confident like these rappers I'm listening to? And as I took students through that process, um, I had to go through the process too. And, you know, and I'm, I still, I'm racked with self doubt all the time. Um, it isn't that I've overcome it. It's just that the things I'm trying to teach my students, I'm actually learning from them, the risks that they take, the ambition that they have. Oh, and it's, but you know, to, to your point, I think that, um, the teaching profession really does just gradually with varying degrees of intensity really chip away at, at an educator's self-concept. We do need opportunities if we're going to be asked to put students in a position to, to empower themselves and to be their authentic selves and to overcome the barriers, we need to also be given opportunities to grow in these areas. You know, I, I did an interview with uh, Dr. April Alexander, who's a forensic psychologist here in Denver. And, you know, she said, you know, the work of social emotional wellness, it needs to start with the adults. Adults need opportunities to practice self, uh, social emotional wellness and engage in, in SEL themselves. Because if, if we are not in the process of thinking about this, how can we ask students to do it? We won't be able to do it. That's right. And you're talking about focusing on students' strengths rather than pointing out their weaknesses because they're already very insecure about their weaknesses. Yeah. And yet that's the ex exact opposite of what's yeah. done to teachers. Yep. It's constantly saying, you know, you are not doing this, you're not doing that. And, and it just makes someone more insecure. Enough. <laughs> here's yeah, the exactly. Enough. <laughs> right. So, so, you know, this is, this is personal work that needs to be done, but yeah. in no way do either of us ever want to downplay the, the systemic influences here. Period. These institutions are not meant to, <laughs> they're not designed in a way that really uplift teachers. Period. Period. Or kids. Yep. You know, I, I know you're really well known um, for giving 100% of yourself in the classroom, but I also know that you were an enthusiastic participant in my 40 hour teacher yes. program. That's part, <laughs> part right here. <laughs> and you know the importance of setting boundaries. You yeah. know um, about, we've already touched a little bit on some of the, the systemic problems. Yeah. And you know how important it is to be really intentional with what you say yes to and what you say no to. So, um, in terms of doing a great job for kids without sacrificing your mental, physical, and emotional well-being, how do you stay focused on what matters most? It's I would I would say, and I think um, every teacher listening to this will probably agree with this that it just varies from day to day, hour to hour, moment to moment. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. You know, I've I've learned that the mathematical reality of a hundred percent is actually not a set thing. Um, sometimes I'm bringing a hundred percent of my exhausted burning out about to collapse self we just uh ended our last week before spring break <laughs> and so mm -hmm. you know just dragging myself across the finish line but i am dragging myself with everything i have <laughs> um and then there and then there are other days when um you know i'm a big basketball fan i love my denver nuggets and so you know for basketball fans will appreciate this but you know when nikola jokic is in his bag he's he's reading the game he's facilitating he's just He's just like dictating everything that's happening and make and sh allowing others to shine. Like sometimes that's my hundred percent, but I think that, um, gosh, there's so much I could say about a uh, 40 hour teacher work week. Um, it really did change my life and it saved my career. Um, I was ready to leave teaching in fall of 2017. Um, I was, my, my school was asking everything of me. I wasn't doing anything. I was not signaling that they should not be asking me to do everything. Um, you know, I think this is where teacher self-confidence is really important because I'm, I'm really easy to flatter. <laughs> it's like, if you tell me <laughs> that, if you tell me, man, you're so amazing at X, Y, and Z, and then you invite me to be on a committee that deals with X, Y, and Z, I'm going to be like, yes, I'll do that because you're so nice to me, you know? And so I, I think that for me personally, it was like, I, how, how often I actually did fall victim to my own tendency to respond to flattery. And like, so that's how they got me to be a teacher lead and a coach. That's how they got me to teach an additional class during my planning period and be on every single committee and all this kind of stuff. And, um, you know, being told that, Hey, no one is better for this than you. So, um, was really exacted a major cost in terms of my wellness. And, you know, um, so I think the really big turning and there's some really ex specific things but i think the really important turning point was i was talking to my friend linwood 
um, who is just, he's, he's just a wise dude and he's funny. It reminds me of the guys I grew up with. And I remember I had really bottomed out. I really hit this really low point where I just couldn't find any optimism. I couldn't find any belief in what I was doing. I didn't think I had anything left to give to kids. I'm like, man, I've just been, I, I just don't have anything to give. And, and here, here I am. I'm here, you know, kind of going through that, uh, crisis. And, um, and he said to me, um, he's like, you know, if you die today, and I was like, I don't like how this is starting. <laughs> he says, if, if you die today, it'll be really sad and tragic. Like people would mourn. There'd be a big assembly. There would be grief counselors called in. And then there would be somebody teaching in your classroom tomorrow. And then eventually somebody will take over your classes and then somebody will take over your uh, role in the department. And somebody will be in this room. You have to take care of yourself because it's a system that just by necessity will make you replaceable and nobody's going to be like you. But in terms of a professional teacher with the qualifications and the certifications to teach exactly what you teach, you're, you can get replaced. So you have to, you have to look after yourself and you have to find ways to ensure that you are the one here and uh, no one else. And I think it was like a matter of weeks um, before I was like, I am signing up for 40 hour teacher work week. Um, <laughs> I'm doing this because I tried so many things over a long career that just, they, they just weren't working. And um, in terms of the specifics, man. So I think, um, I think the central aspects for me had to do with grading with purpose in everything you do and the kind of the long-term balance aspects, aspects, like I love the concept of of every school year being a season, that the school year happens in multiple seasons. And I think about that as, a, as like the NBA season where it's a long season. It's six months and a team changes over the course of that time. And it isn't about whether you were perfect for six months. It was whether, whether you were getting better at the right time. And so, um, so framing that and just saying, I don't have to succeed in teaching my content today, right? I can keep chipping away at it. I can highlight the good things and I can keep notes about the things I want to get a little bit better at. Um, so that kind of vision was really helpful. Um, I love how you are so honest in the materials. Like I think the first sentence I read was, okay, before you get started, you will not be down to 40 hours today. And especially at the beginning of the year, the stuff where it's like you're going to put in some extra time. And over the course of the year, the system is such that there's probably a need to put in that extra time. And I think especially, you know, from your experience as an early ed uh, teacher, knowing that elementary classrooms just take so much setup and so much planning, like you're probably going to work more for the first few weeks. But if you are attentive to processes and systems and having a clear sense of what you are and are not doing this year, it will level out. And, and I was like, I'm going to give this a shot because I think even if it helps me save five hours of my week, that's going to be worth it. That's five hours I can give to my family. That's five hours that I can give to the things that I love that don't have to do with teaching. Like, okay, like I'll give it a shot. Um, in more concrete terms, I would say the two most important things that have helped me revive my teaching career um, are the fact that I don't have to grade everything. And in fact, there are now studies coming out that say that there is a much higher correlation to student success with just feedback with no grades than there is with, you know, sort of falsely incentivizing kids with grades. Mm -hmm. um, so you've made me kind of a, a grading abolitionist. Um, <laughs> I love it. I still struggle to let it go, like, because we're indoctrinated and... Um, but, but when I tell my students, there's one graded assignment a week. That's it. Everything else is your practice and everything else is for your benefit. And I'm going to work hard to give you feedback, but you know, and, and it's just changed conversations. Um, so that's been a big thing. And then inviting students into the important, uh, processes of the classroom and saying that we run a classroom so that we can all be successful and so that we can all enjoy our time together. And, um, it's been great. And so, you know, to those who are kind of ambivalent about, you know, the investment, um, it's worth it first. And second of all, it's not a magic bean. Like you're not, you're not going to be living this like paradise life. Like the first time you get your, your materials in your email, like it's a process that ebbs and flows. 
Um, sometimes you are utterly transformative and profound and powerful. Sometimes good enough is good enough. Like this is something that my former coach, Melanie told me just like, Hey, yeah, I know you don't feel great about that lesson, but you were clear about what the students needed to do. The students were clear in what they had to do. They showed success. They all got their work in. Nobody complained. Everybody was feeling positive. Eh, that was good enough. And good enough is good enough. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think, you know, I could go on and on and on and on and on, but I really do think that in a very real and concrete way, like literally, I wouldn't be Colorado Teacher of the Year for 2021 without the 40 hour teacher work week because I would have quit. I would have left. Wow. That is, um, that's humbling to hear. <laughs> and I could, I could say, I'm definitely glad that you stuck around because you are making a big difference for teachers and kids by staying. Uh, but it's actually, it's my homepage, it's still my homepage on my personal well. <laughs> computer. Like, I'm like, because, uh, because the thing is, it's easy to fall off the wagon when mm -hmm. you, uh, you know, the pressures of the school year are such that, okay, I don't have time to read this or listen to this. I just need to jump in and do things. So it really means a lot for me to just open up my computer and, you know, and right there, it's like locked on. I'm, I'm in the graduate program now. So I'm very excited about that. Mm -hmm. Um, and it just goes right to that page as a reminder that, hey, this is here. And if you're struggling, you should probably scan over this stuff. Yeah, that's that's a really smart approach because it really is ongoing work. You know, there's no one who just like goes through and and does everything the first year. It's like, OK, now yeah. I, I'm great. Like it really is a lifelong process. And, you know, a lot of people find they get the best results even in the second, third, fourth year as they go through and just continually streamlining because yeah. and teaching changes, you change, yeah. you know, there's. There's, it really is a, a lifelong process of learning how to best manage your time and your tasks and, yeah, and those and, kinds of things. And I would even say I'm still not a 40 hour teacher. Um, <laughs> but, but I feel like that number is not like, that's not actually the goal. Uh, like the goal is how do you, how do you give your best in all areas of life, not just in your job? And so, you know, it, it informs how I respond to asks. When somebody says, Hey, we have this committee. It'd be great for you to be on. Well, I pop open my calendar. I was like, okay, let me just show you all my responsibilities. So tell me where you think this fits <laughs> because I, I would love to be a part of this, but you know, I can, you know, my, my whole thing, what I will always tell people, uh, when I can't take on another thing is like, I, I will not dishonor your initiative by giving you any less than a hundred percent. And I can't give you a hundred percent on this. And, um, best of luck. I'll recommend some people that I think are really great. Um, I've also become really comfortable with telling people that I'm not interested in things, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. where they say, Hey, we have this committee around X, Y, and Z. And I'll say, Oh, that's great. That's not a big priority for me, but I'm really glad it's your priority. And I think it's awesome that you're doing this. It's just not something I'm willing to commit a whole lot of my time to because every minute that I spend on your project is a minute that I'm not spending with my spouse. It's a minute that I'm not spending with my teenage daughter. It's a minute I'm not spending writing and doing the things that I love and reading and exercising. Like it means a lot for me to stay fit. And so I, you have to get into the habit of, of having that conversation with yourself where, and, and it, and it, it takes time. Like it's still hard not to be flattered for me, but, um, but it takes time and, and it's a matter of being able to say, yeah. So if I give here, where am I taking from? And am I, am I okay with taking from that space? It's so key to, to know what is important to you and where you can make the biggest impact. I found that makes it a lot easier to say no. no you know, when you realize this is not actually in my wheelhouse and it's just not something I care about that much. And if I don't really care about it, I'm not going to do a great job on yeah, it. Yeah, just not. not. We're going to be disappointed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so knowing what you're passionate about and what you're really good at, what what only you can contribute, I think, is so important. Yeah. And um, I'd like to talk a little bit more about that actually, because there's just okay. there's so much change happening right now in the yeah. world and in the education field. Yeah. Um. So, what are the things that you're really fired up about? You're wanting to devote your time and energy and focus to what's really fueling you in, yeah. in the days ahead. I guess the thing that really is just setting me on fire right now is how much communities need us. Um, and, and it's not just our students, but it's, it's the families they come from. It's the neighborhoods that they come from. Um, I have been in constant conversation with parents and other family members about students and just like really trying to listen to them. Um, I'm really as teacher of the year, a big part of my message is how we stop the attacks on black teachers and communities. Um, we, we know that across the system, 
uh, black teachers are being run out of the profession. And, um, and we've seen a bunch of things happening in Colorado that kind of add to that. So being that I grew up in a predominantly black neighborhood and owe so much of my sense of self and my sense of place and identity, uh, to Denver's black community, um, really drives me to do that. Um, I think that so much of this past year has us really questioning, or some of us, there, there are some that want to just get back to the way things were on March 12th of 2020. Um, but I think that we are in a real position to address some of the, the persistent inequities and, um, unjust systems within education. So I'm super fired up about abolishing all grading. Um, that's something that, um, you know, my work with, with, uh, 40 hour teacher work week, as well as with, you know, there's a Canadian educator, Natalie Vardabasso that I've like talked to a lot about this. Um, and finding ways to disrupt the cult of achievement. I think that one of the things that gets in the way of any of us becoming like self-actualized people, um, is that there is this cult of achievement that if you're not pers participating in the cult of achievement, then you're not doing anything worthwhile. And I would just love to find ways to disrupt that. Um, and, uh, and then finally, I guess the expectation across the system, I, th I think that it's important that we embrace, understand and celebrate difference. Um, and high speed internet is a civil right. There's just a lot. Um, so basically, <laughs> basically I'm just doing whatever Dr. Bettina Love tells me to do. Um, <laughs> and I do it. I read her book. I'm like, Oh, okay. I should do that. Um, but there's a lot that's really firing me up, but I think a lot of it can probably be captured in the phrase, um, humanizing pedagogy. I think it's important to get into that space where we are humanizing every single person that is participating in the educational system, wherever they're doing it, because we have a real opportunity to do that right now. Yes. And yes to the shout out to Dr. Bettina Love. Yes. Her book, We Want to Do More Than Survive, mm -hmm. is the book, the oh, man. book oh, man. for this moment. We stand. <laughs> I, I am. I'm so I listened to your episode that you did on your podcast with her. It was amazing. I've asked, I've reached out to her team three times over the past oh, wow. nine months asking her to be on Truth for Teachers. I haven't gotten a response. But oh, I'm not for love. <laughs> giving up. I'm not giving up. Don't give up. Don't give up. <laughs> I'm gonna see if I can bring y'all together because because two dope humans who really believe in in uh, schooling for the right purposes. Um, yeah. And, in you know, full disclosure, I'm, I'm fairly certain, uh, it was NEA that was able to get her, um, for us. <laughs> so, so that kind of helped. Um, but yeah, she, she's amazing. And that conversation was so enlightening and educational. And like, we, we were just, again, starstruck. We're like, we can't believe we're talking to Dr. Love. We're like talking to Dr. Love. What? <laughs> yeah. I'll link to it in the show notes because people should definitely. Check oh, that out. You. Tell thank us more about your podcast while we're on the, on the subject of that. Oh yeah. So two dope teachers and a mic is, um, a couple of, uh, school teachers from the city of Denver, myself and my amazing partner, Kevin Adams. Um, we started just chopping it up about the things that we would laugh about and complain about after staff meetings. And then we got it in our heads that maybe we should do a podcast. And, uh, what we attempt to do in a two person format is to, um, to just kind of talk about ways that we need to be re remixing this conversation on race, power, and education. Um, we both had very particular experiences, both as black and brown teachers and as black and brown students. Um, and we've done a lot of thinking around um, what anti-racism really looks like in the classroom. And so the pod's super fun. Um, we've had some really, really cool guests. We would love to have you on at some point, not, not putting you on blast on your own show. Um, <laughs> but, but with, no, you with, know, I'd love to. Absolutely. Oh, let's do it. And so, but we just really find that there's a wider conversation that primarily teachers of color are having, but that is now becoming relevant to a lot of people. And we feel like we've gotten our own kind of incredible professional development out of it. Like just these folks that we get to talk to and the insights that they give us, it's, it's really, really, um, humbling and, and staggering. So, um, yeah, we have a lot of fun on the show. <laughs> what would you say to an educator who's listening to this and thinking, I wish I had that kind of energy and passion. <laughs> I, I feel like I used to, but I'm mostly just discouraged and now just drained by everything that's asking of me. What does a teacher who's feeling like that need to know? Um, so the first thing they need to know is, and I'm not always like this. <laughs> yeah, that's good to know. Like, I think that, um, I think most days my breakfast consists of coffee and adrenaline. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but I think, um, I think, it, I think part of it comes from a deep understanding of how I tick and what I need. Um, 
I need to laugh every day. I need to, you know, it's like Jim, Jim Valvano, um, as he fought cancer, he talked about how you need to laugh every day. You need to be moved to tears every day and you need to learn something every day. And if you're doing that, you're living a pretty good life. And so, um, and I would add engaging in, in some creativity. So I, um, I write freestyles for my students, um, to kind of sum up what, what I experienced with them, uh, that day. I don't do it every day. Um, but you know, and I'll share that with them. So there's a creative piece to it, but I, I guess, I guess it, I guess as I, as I've aged and I, as I've continued to remind myself that a, my body can't take like 200% every minute of every day anymore, but B I, I've gained some wisdom. I would venture to say in my forties where I can say, you know, I cannot bring my energy if I'm spread so thinly, if I'm neglecting the things that matter, like, how am I going to be any good to anybody else? Like, how am I going to be a positive presence in the lives of, in the lives of my students? If I'm not even a, a positive presence in my own life, really just drawing that line. Like I said, you know, when I first started with the 40 hour teacher uh, stuff, I set an alarm to close my computer at 4:30. No matter what I was working on, I wouldn't even shut down. This actually became a problem with updating it. But, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I, you know, that alarm would go off and I would just tell myself, no matter what you're doing, I'm close the computer because you can come back to it tomorrow when you're back in your work day. And, um, you know, everything can wait. And, you know, the other thing I would say to teachers is that, you know, you can work around the clock. You can work 24 seven. You can find a way to not ever need sleep, food, water, or to go to the bathroom. And everything that a teacher is expected to do still will not get done. It That's still right. won't get done. It's endless. And so we're in a position where we can choose to end it and just say, it's over. I'm closing my computer and I'm going to watch Netflix. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm going to cook a meal, going to do those things. Also meal planning. I didn't talk about how important meal planning was in that uh, stuff. So anyway, <laughs> um, but but I really do think that it's it's just taking like, Knowing that, um, I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent energetic every single day, but I'm real with how I feel. I communicate it to my students. I'll tell them I'm, I'm feeling really sensitive today. Y'all, I don't know why. So if I am weird today, this is probably why and I'm working on it. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. um, so yeah, that's what I would say is like, you know, um, it's easy to get discouraged and, um, there needs to be a real conversation that you have with others. And if you have a relationship with your leader, where you, and I fortunately do, where you can say, I am falling apart and I need to breathe. I, I still believe that most leaders have a conscience <laughs> where they'll say, I do not want you to fall apart, <laughs> you know? Um, but yeah, just recognizing where you're at and, um, and just prioritizing, you know, what is it that I'm able to bring every day and how do I best cultivate that? Hmm. This was so helpful and so good, Gerardo. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. <laughs> this is great. I want to close out with a takeaway truth. What yeah. is something that you wish every educator understood about what we discussed here today and teaching authentically? Yeah. So I think I have two because <laughs> I'm okay. extra and I go overboard. Um, <laughs> so the first is just to be a learner. I think that that is probably the best educators that I've ever known were tireless learners. Um, students and communities are your teachers. Um, and, you know, see your colleagues and your students and their communities and celebrate them. Like, the, you know, every year is different. Every class is different. Um, and it's because of the humans that we come into contact with. And the other thing I would say is that, you know, I think setting dedicated boundaries for yourself where I'm not doing anything like during that time, this is my time for me. Um, is really important. So for me, my boundary is 3.30 to 4.30. I just don't schedule things. That's when I exercise. That's when I relax. That's when I just don't work on things that have to do with my job. And, you know, at first it was really tough to do that. And there are obviously times where I have to work into that time, but I have it actually in my Google calendar. It's like, and it literally, it just says 3.30 to 4.30, stop. Hmm. <laughs> and then if I need to work after that or like, you know, whatever, then, or if I need to cut it a little short every now and then, I don't make it a habit, but it's always a reminder that this is your time. And we have to tell ourselves that um, because so many teachers feel guilt for hmm. taking care of themselves. So be a learner and don't feel guilty. <laughs>